Hey everyone, we're off for another week of Find Your Film. We have, I think, Bruce Perky, is this our record as far as how many movies, featured movies we have to cover? I'm thinking. I think so. Oh, hang on. My throat's a little dry. I need to drink okay. something. That's um, okay. To the, um, I need to drink drink something oh. here. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's showing a psycho Gorman you glass. You son of a bitch. How does, how does a psycho Gorman glass feel uh. Uh, to support your drink? Is it good? Drinking the blood of my enemies is refreshing on a nice <laughs> spring night. Eric Holmes, let's get you in on this. PG Psycho Gorman, does that, why does that movie continue to stay with us? Why do you think as as Bruce drinks from that Psycho Gorman I, I think it's, it's a fun movie. It's got a bunch of memorable lines. It knows what it is and it does its thing well, as opposed to, is there, there's a version of this movie where they're like, ha ha, it's stupid, we're not gonna try. This doesn't do that. It it tries and it nails everything it goes for and it does everything well. Yes. Do you second and that? Emo- they have quite the uh, physical. <laughs> oh my goodness. What is this? What is this? A psycho PG Psycho Gorman for <laughs> and the Blu ray. My goodness. Very good. Wait a second. I think Eric Holmes, Bruce Perky, are you working for the PG Psycho Gorman PG uh, for short uh, campaign? What is this, Bruce? Hey, where do I get uh, the duck? People who run PG, I'm more than happy to be called PG Psycho Whore Man. If you want to pay me some money, I will do it. <laughs> By the way, I, I have been, last couple of weeks, I have been addicted to cryptocurrency. So even though Eric Holmes and Bruce Perky will accept coin fiat currency i had no idea what fiat currency was fiat currency is actually means u.s dollars eric holmes and bruce perky will accept u.s dollars makers of pg psycho gorman but me i'm i, I am i'm all about the DeFi. you can pay us also in crypto don't worry guys if they pay us in crypto listeners i'll make sure to convert it so you guys get the dollars i'm, I'm all about the i'm all about the altcoins what about you bruce you all about the altcoins are you gonna sing all about yeah. the benjamins uh, eric holmes no yeah. no no sure no? sure Good, good. So anyways, the the reason why I wanted to say PG Psycho Gorman, good job guys on promoting that wonderful film. We never announce news on the show other than to promote our stuff, promote other podcasts. Maybe we should start just announcing news. And it's thanks to you, you guys for actually bringing this up. I saw this a couple of days ago on my email, which I actually opened. PG Psycho Gorman. To, yeah, I know, Bruce. I, you're surprised. PG Psycho Gorman to premiere exclusively on Shutter on May 20th. Mm, what do you guys think? May 20, Bruce, you're, you've been the advocate 420, of that 420 has got to be a total, total coincidence. Has nothing to do with how you might want to experience Psycho Gorman, <laughs> PG Psycho Gorman. Just yes. Saying. Yeah. May 20th, not 4. Is that 420? What is it? 4, 420? Oh, shoot. It's 520. Oh, God. It's a whole different thing. That's evil. Let's not yeah, talk that's about e- that. It's in some, some <laughs> evil stuff. But anyways, PG Psycho Gorman. In fact, I've actually promised to actually buy that. Who's the main white villain? The... What is the, the what is it called the the villain the, the main antagonist in PG Psycho Gorman the Templar I want to get one of those Templar figures that's the one figure that I really want to get so that's the other cup I have but I don't have it with me at the moment oh really okay so <laughs> Bruce Perky let's see the swag merch right now you have two cups of PG Psycho Gorman and I'm assuming you have the disc or the DVD I remember you have one of those which one do you have the DVD and it's got the I can't you can't see it it's way behind me but it's a Happy Meal box oh, that yeah. the cups come in. So yeah, amazing, my friend, amazing. And Eric Holmes, you at least you have the physical media. You all, you're all about the physical media, right? Well, yeah. So when it comes out on Shutter, I'll be able to watch it on Shutter and play it on a disc that I have right here on my big wall of TVs. I look like an '80s villain, and maybe on one of the TVs on the bottom, I can also play "Lose the Flower of Evil," which I also have on disc. Oh, "Lose the Flower of Evil." Eric Holmes is waving that flag for "Lose the Flower of Evil." Shame. I know, Bruce, you've seen that movie, Lose the Flower of Evil. Shame on me for not watching it. It's available currently on Shudder, but you, you decided to get the DVD anyway, right? It's just, I'm sure it's still streaming on Shudder. But. One, one of the cool things, that I mean, besides being an awesome movie, is their artwork. I mean, fuck, look at this thing. That's that looks freaking cool. Yeah. And they always, they always have different artworks for like different physical medias and posters. Like, I've seen like five or six different posters, I think. And they all look fantastic. And the art styles are just completely different on each one. Okay, so before we get to our main films, and we're going to talk a little bit about what Bruce has been doing the last week. Eric Holmes, if someone who has no idea what Lose the Flower of Evil is, Lose the Flower of Evil will appeal to movie buffs who love blank. Love blank. Uh, 
uh, Sound of Music and Evil Dead. Come on, smash them together, and you have lose the Flower of Evil. Bruce Berge, how's that for the for the description? Music. Is it okay? Is it a good is hybrid? Is it do you do you see the connection? Bruce, I would say exactly what he said, and then just mix it with a little, a little old topo, oh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Holy just, mountain, just some holy mountain. Topo it off with. Some... <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so, some very interesting movies that you guys definitely have to see once you guys see it would love to hear what you think now our featured reviews this week are go- going to be we're going to do a movie a, a really interesting pig movie animal film called gunda it's shot in black and white bruce and eric they're going to cover this movie called sugar daddy and maybe that might be me in about 10 years after i'm rich in crypto maybe they'll be telling my story i have no no <laughs> yes <laughs> and then and then me and eric we're going to do this movie called called jacob's wife before we get to those main reviews we're talking about what bruce Perky has been doing the last week he's been hard at work behind the mic bruce can you tell our listeners what have you been grinding about what, what have you been talking about last week Oh, I just continued the conversation about the not Oscar-nominated shorts, and I interviewed uh, Eric O, oh, who directed and created pretty much everything to do with opera, which we talked about and uh, praised on here. And also, I spoke with Alice Doyar, and who's a producer, and Anthony Gican- Giacchino, who is the director of the Oscar-nominated short uh, documentary, Colette. Wow. So those two should be coming out soon. And we may have an upcoming one. We're just kind of hoping with the director of White Eye. Yes, we'll see. Either most likely it might be Bruce. If they Bruce can't fit it into his schedule, I'll fit it into my schedule. It's uh, White Eye. Eric Holmes, you lo- we all love that film, right? That White Eye on no takes. Wait, when he what's what one con- one continuous shot kind of kind of short. So yeah. yeah, very 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 good stuff. So listeners, you will be uh, treated to Bruce Perky's really what is it? Uh, how would you describe it, Eric Holmes, his astute interviewing skills this weekend when we upload a couple of his those interviews, those aforementioned interviews? That'll be part, an extra special part of our Find Your Film feed. If you haven't seen any of the shorts yet, I would probably say op, start off with opera because, Eric, do you remember what you and Bruce Perky called opera? One word. Do you, do you remember what the word you and him, you and Bruce called it? I believe I used masterpiece probably mm-hmm. more than once, and I still yes. mean it. Okay, and you still, Eric Holmes always mean it means that un, sometimes I don't mean it. it. It just I only mean it sometimes when the movies come out that week, and then I, and then maybe I sh- I shudder to think I shudder to think about how my opinions might change as the weeks progress. Now, okay, that is that. That is our. Do we have any movie rewinds? No movie re- rewinds this week. Nothing. I don't nothing think exciting. So. Any? Oh, quickly, Eric Holmes. Any purchases the last several days, several weeks that you've received? Or you went to entertain Mart and anything? Or you, Bruce? Any physical media? Anything? Yes, I got a. I I got one, but we'll talk about that later. So I'll bring oh, that. Very up. cool. Very very <laughs> I'll nice. Bring that up later. Okay, I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that. That's going to be your recommendation. Oh, I have here on our Google Docs, Eric's recommendations. Oh, I think. Oh, it should be interesting to see. He has a couple of good picks, and uh, I don't know. One of them would be probably a very nostalgic little recommendation that I. I, I'm very emotionally attached to, so excited about that. But first and foremost, let us get to our main review of this week. How do I start? Bruce, you want to start off with Gunda? It's a black and white film. It centers on the titular character who is a sow. And we open up with Gunda behind a, what, sort of a, not a barn door, but you could, it looks into that wooden shed and it, it's a slow, I think, close up or something like that. We, we see, Gunda existing in in all that in all that beauty and slowly but surely there's little piglets that come right come out, come into frame and then we basically it's 90 minutes of watching Gunda and her children frolic about or just walk about yeah. the the farm in Oslo and then it cuts to chickens and cows yeah and then it goes back to it goes yeah, back it's to like Gunda. it's like yeah it's like yeah. 15 minutes of piglets feeding off the mama gunda and then another 10 minutes of some chickens close up so chicken feet walking and then another five or 10 minutes of a one-legged chicken kind of walking and then another 10 or 15 minutes of cows with flies on their faces and then um 
I really like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you like Eric Holmes? I love that little twist. He was pre- he was going for the misdirection by sounding so matter of fact. And you really love this movie. Well, look, in the, in the official press release, it says it calls it experiential cinema. It was one of the reasons why you love this movie is you went into Gunda with the right frame yes. of mind. Okay. Yes, I was seasoned to prepare for this movie by Greg on his uh, Patreon cinematics uh, discussion of this. So you should might want to get involved in that if you haven't done that yet. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, it was good. This is one of those movies you definitely want to go in knowing what you're going to get. I mean, I think if you like those kind of movies that are very almost meditative, like uh, I kind of bring up something like Baraka, if you've ever seen Baraka or Kiana Scotsy or some of those kind of movies, even though it's not that in subject matter, um, or like even the documentaries of Earth, you know, yeah. those documentaries, but without the narration and without music, you're just going to sit with these moments. And it's beautiful, beautiful black and white photography and surprisingly has um, these smooth pans and, and swing camera movements and things so you're not exactly expecting, but uh, yeah. It's not going to be for everybody. I mean, I guarantee the average just walking off the street, want to watch a documentary would probably go, oh my God, this is the most boring thing I've ever seen, you know? So that could happen to people. That is very fair. That is very, that, that, yeah. and you know what? That could, no, no, I'm going to correct, I'm going to correct you. That, <laughs> that will happen to people that could have, that, that will happen. Eric Holmes. Well, Bruce, Bruce you, lo- you really enjoyed it. I did, yes. I ultimately really enjoyed it, but I think I would, like I said, I was prepared. So I kind of went into it with that attitude, like, okay, I know what I'm going to get. Let's give this a chance. But if I would have come in cold on this, I might have, I might have gone the other way. So, and listeners, I I mean this in the best way because I am a Brian Eno fan. Listen to some really relaxing Brian Eno music or meditative kind of music before you you watch Gunda. Don't listen to awesome bands like Hardline. Or or Guns and Roses are we? We'll call back to our Gunda line. and Roses though. You can listen to that one. <laughs> Gunda and Roses. Very good. Eric Holmes, are you jumping on the Bruce Perky bandwagon on this? Regarding I, your feelings on on Gunda, as well as his intro, because this movie, to describe it, sounds like the most boring thing on the planet. But I couldn't look away. Like like it's like oh look at the piglets. All right, the piglets are suckling on the mom. Okay, all right. That's uh, why am I still watching this? And then the next thing you know, it's like I'm an hour in. It. I'm like, how come I haven't turned this off yet? And I don't know why. <laughs> like this, this movie is, for all intents and purposes, this movie is boring. But I couldn't stop watching it. It, it was, yeah. uh, and I can't. I don't know why. Oh, I'm supposed to be a movie reviewer and I can't even properly <laughs> review this movie because I was uh, transfixed the entire time and I have no idea why. And everything about this movie should have just turned me off and it just kept me riveted. And okay. the, uh, I, I, I think maybe it's like, a, you know, because I got dogs and they'll like just kind of, you know, I'll sit there and just watch them play in the living room. You know, they're not doing anything. Their dogs are just playing around. But I'll sit there and watch them. I mean, it's kind of like that. Just watching a bunch of cute piglets doing cute piglet thing. Um, uh, probably should warn people. There's one particular part with a uh, runt that uh, <laughs> the mom doesn't treat very well, we'll say. Oh, um, my goodness. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, but then uh, the, that's pretty much as dark as it gets, like, throughout the throughout the rest. So, like, it's not a... Uh, Cause I, I was, I was kind of bracing for the, uh, okay. When's the, when's the part of then where they uh, take them to the slaughter and do all the close up stuff. They, it never, never went there. You're just, you're just watching them live their life. And, uh, and I, I, I can't explain why, but it's just, I, I couldn't take my eyes off it. But again, Eric, I would say out of all of us three, you're very good at warning people the best. What would you warn be- viewers if they want to see this movie opens in select theaters friday april 16th would you what would you warn them don't go to this i would if... uh warn them not to uh bring a date <laughs> 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 i would uh, warn them not to bring their kids uh not because right. it's violent but because the kids will not like unless kids like going to uh you know if kids like going to petting zoos and they like watching pigs and chickens and cows and stuff maybe they will dig it i don't know but this is uh 
I mean, this is not a crowd pleasing midnight movie by any stretch of the imagination. It's just kind of kind of like what Bruce said. It's a uh, meditative, but it's um, yeah, it's, it's basically just an hour and a half of uh, watching animals. And if that sounds like your thing, you're gonna love this. And if that doesn't sound like your thing, you might still love it. <laughs> and I can't, I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I, you know, also I love black and white films, so. I guess on a very superficial aesthetic level, I like watching black and white films, so I'm automatically biased to it. This movie is executive produced by vegan Joaquin Phoenix. I like to call myself a vegetarian about 98% of the time. And I, I know Paul Thomas Anderson also loves this movie. I think a lot of people will as, can ascribe a lot of philosophical meaning from Gunda. Bruce Porky, do you think this movie is a lot deeper than it is with people coming up with big thoughts about animals and, and sentient beings, that whole thing? Or do you think just you should just enjoy it for what it is and not ascribe all this philosophical, or should you be a meat eater or, or, or a vegetarian, that kind of stuff to it in the mix? I guess the only way that I would say that the philosophical aspect would be there would be that they're treating what we consider different than other beautiful na nature, right? Like we have all these documentaries about, you know, pick your, pick your, really exotic, beautiful animal, but they're giving it that exact same focus and care and, you know, finances and all this stuff around essentially farm animals on a farm. <laughs> so I think that aspect is, is trying to say equalize it, right? If you think these other animals are worth preserving and are beautiful and, and like amazing, like, well, you can do the same thing with these animals. You just put them behind a fence and decide to eat them. So I think that would be kind of the philosophical level you'd get to. Although I will say, and once again, we're not saying how this kind of rolls out at the end, but I would say the last 10 minutes is pretty, you know, it, it could be emotional for some people if you stick it through the end. So I think, uh, I think it's pretty cool, pretty well done. And the thing that really is good about this is it's not manipulative in the sense of it doesn't give you music. It doesn't give you cute voices. It doesn't have a voiceover telling you the story to give you all these, you have to, other than picking what it shows you, it just shows you stuff. So, you know, what's so funny about that, what you just said, it's if this, if Gunda used music or a voiceover, it still would have worked. And the, the director, he knows he could have done that, but I really love when they just, they strip it away. And yeah. Eric, did you think that was a risk with Gunda or do you think that was no, the obvious choice? Uh, no. And I, I don't think this movie is particularly deep either. I think it's a Rorschach test. You get whatever you put into it because the, the movie doesn't give you anything really other than visuals of you get to watch pigs and piglets. You get to watch the one-legged rooster hop around and you get to watch <laughs> the cows and then you get to watch the pig again, yeah. but it, it doesn't give you a story. It doesn't give you anything. So anything you take out of this movie is basically from your own head, whatever you're watching, whatever you take from it, if you're watching it. And I mean, it is a pretty intimate look at these animals. You know, it, it stays with them for a long time. You get to watch them do their day to day. And so I think a lot of people might watch this and feel a kinship to them, you know, fall in love with them like they would a pet maybe. And so maybe that could turn someone vegan. Uh, it didn't work on me, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty, but I, I could see this working on a lot of people in that way. But again, it, I don't, I wouldn't credit the movie for that. I would credit the viewer for anything they pull out of it. Very cool. The only thing I would add is it's kind of like, it's kind of doing like what Andy Warhol did with a soup can though, right? Like Andy Warhol takes a soup can, sticks it on a wall, frames it, changes the color a little bit and says, now it's art. So in a sense, it's kind of doing that. It's taking something super ordinary, a chicken, and it's saying like, treat it, treat it the same as you would these other things, you know, mm -hmm. just in that aspect, it's kind of trying to, I don't know, elevate it, I guess, or something. Well, fair enough. To be true to tell, a week and a half, I, I've, I saw this movie over a week and a half ago, Gunda, and I received the screening link. I interviewed the director. I'm going to put that director up on our on our channel as well. But I was actually nervous to actually to give you guys a screener link because of this is one of those movies. I'm so we glad that <laughs> I'm so glad both of you liked it. I, th I think solid recommends. I'm, I'm going to put words. I think solid recommends all aboard. I, Re kind of. To the kind right of. kind of person, yeah. and the right kind of mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of. Because I, 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 I couldn't just blindly recommend this to anybody. Because I'm sure there's some people going to watch it and and 
again, this is a Rorschach test. You get whatever you put into it. If you're watching it saying, okay, movie, what do you got for me? It's not going to give you anything. You got to put it in to, yeah. to get it back. And so if you go in it with the wrong mindset, you're going to watch this and go, that was boring. I was just watching pigs in a, like, that's literally all it is. Yeah, and you would, be, you would be right as well. You have to go to that mindset when you were a little kid and you could just watch a video of trucks yeah. for two hours or tractors for two hours or the ocean for two hours. If you can do that, then you're probably good to go with this movie. Yeah, very cool. I'm so glad. This was a really cool conversation. <laughs> we got, okay, Gunda <laughs> directed by Victor Kozakowski, executive produced by Joaquin Phoenix. The star of the film obviously is Gunda and it's out in theaters April 16th. So that is our first review. If you check it out, Tell us what you, what you think uh, of uh, Gunda. Really interesting film. Now, the second movie for this week is a movie that I believe it's early, currently out on, on demand. Eric Holmes was smart enough to actually request this movie for us to review this week. And, you know, I wish Eric Holmes, like, credit again, Eric Holmes and Bruce Perky, they every single week, they request movies to see. And they help me open up all these bleeping emails that I never opened. And it's, this is a movie called Sugar Daddy. I am very remiss that I still have not seen this. Seen this. So, Eric, can you uh, tell us what you think of Sugar Daddy? Or, or uh, what is it about? You and Bruce Perky are going to handle this review. Well, what's it about? It's about a, uh, uh, we'll say a starving artist. Uh, I forget the, uh, lady, the character's name, but uh, she's a musician and she's trying to make ends meet. And she finds a uh, thing online where she can basically be an escort, not not a prostitute, but just someone that goes on dates with rich people and they, they pay her for her time. And it's just kind of her, you know, I, I guess her day to day life. And every once in a while, they kind of cut through, uh, they cut to these little uh, vignette scenes of her, it's like music video type scenes. And it I, I love this movie first and foremost. I think wow. the, the writing in this is fantastic um, because every, it doesn't, it doesn't quite go the direction you think a movie like this would. The characters like the Johns or I, I don't know if John's correct word for, for this instance, um, but maybe oh, the we'll Greggs, the Greggs. Yeah. The Greggs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, they, they're, you know, you, you would think that, okay, she's, uh, she's doing this uh, escort service thing or the sugar daddy thing. Oh, this is the part where the, uh, the guy's going to try to rape her, but they don't really go that, they don't really go that route. You get to actually know the people that she's going on the dates with. Some of her friends give her shit. And so, you know, it feels like, everyone all the characters have their own unique point of view on everything and the uh you know the writer which i i, I think the writer's the uh the lead actor right yep yeah, yeah kelly, so, kelly mccormick yep. yeah yeah and so uh i mean she's fantastic actor and fantastic writer and just everyone has their own unique point of view and you can tell that she's kind of uh has her point of view as a writer but she doesn't shove it in your face by straw manning all the rest of the characters. Everyone's a complete character. And uh, I just, the more this went along, the more I fell in love with it. And then the uh, last scene, uh, which, you know, unfortunately can't get into, it's not like a big twist or anything, but the last scene was another one of those vignettes. And it was just, uh, just kind of ended perfect for me. Like in front to back, I, I just love this movie. I didn't think I would at first because it started off not quite the movie I thought I was getting. But as it went on, I just kept falling in love with it more and more. And I hope that come award time, this wins like all the best screenplay awards ever because I, I cannot stress enough how great the writing is in this. That is amazing, Eric. What you requested this specific movie and what were you initially thinking that we were going to get when you requested I, I I really didn't know. I, I just saw the the poster look good. It was called Sugar Daddy. I thought it'd be like kind of like an exploitation sort of thing, like a a Ms. Forty Five or maybe a Promising Young Woman. Yeah. And I would say it's as good as I would say it's as good as Promising Young Woman, but it's got more of the tone of something like Sound of Metal, where it's got that really kind of low key kind of low key kind of tone to it. Um, but it, it's also funny. It's, it's uh, I think it's a lot funnier than Sound of Metal, but it's not cool. like, uh, 
it's not like a laugh a minute sort of thing it's just the characters are clever but not so cl- not like the writerly clever which we'll get into that when we talk about a, another movie after this Uh-oh. but uh, <laughs> uh but uh yeah this uh, this is just throwing through a, a great movie and i hope it does really well and i was quite surprised with it i'm gonna be honest there's Eric Holmes is a champion for independent cinema. I'm thinking right off the top of my head, Lose the Flower of Evil. What was the other one? Rent a Pal or something? Rent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And this is this movie, Sugar Daddy. I this is one of the I think the top movies that Eric Holmes has really championed. You know this. So this is I can't wait to see this movie. I am. Yeah. Mis- I am totally missing out, Bruce Perky. I want to get your take on mm-hmm. Sugar Daddy. Um, do you concur, or what are the strengths or weaknesses you saw regarding yeah, this movie? Yeah, I I didn't love it quite as much, but I don't dislike it at all. It's good. It's a really good movie. For me, it didn't quite catch me as strong. But that being said, uh, and I think I might have talked over it. We'll say it again. Kelly McCormick, she's the writer and the star of this. I think she plays a character named Darren. And what is really good about, um, first of all, her acting is amazing in it. Her writing is really strong and kind of to to hop on to what Eric was saying, she doesn't write her character as just sympathetic. She, she So easily this character could be like sympathetic and naive, right? And that she doesn't know what she's getting into and then everyone takes advantage of her. But she's not like that. She's, she's a sharp, you see her, she's sharp all the way through. She's actually really kind of brash and she's kind of, unlikable in some aspects too like she's kind of shitty to certain people around her too but that's kind of makes her a more rounded real person and also to write her own character with some complexity like that is like you know eric says it's it's you know making a complete character for herself and other people in this now i would say for me the 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 spots where it really sang the middle portion of this movie i think to me was the strongest the end portion there's some things that happen that are a little a little kind of expected in categories of this kind of movie, like some of the things that go down, even though they're done in a, in a, in a good way, but the middle portion, especially where she's kind of been doing it for a while and she's kind of blinded herself to exactly what might be going on. And there's this party where her and all of her kind of hipstery New Yorky kind of people all get together and they all start calling each other on the shit. And I don't know what Eric thought of that scene, but that scene I thought was amazing. And then shortly after that, there's a scene where her live-in um, apartment roommate, who's of course pining over her, but friend zoned. There's a scene with those two that right almost immediately after the party, if I remember correctly. And that scene is really great too. Those two scenes alone are better than most movies that you see right now. That, oh, that's that, huge. That, that, that friend zone scene was, <laughs> I mean, th- this thing was just full of just awesome scenes, but that friend yeah. zone one is like, what you think I only a fuck? Is that what come over here? Oh yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And um yeah, like so basically uh, yeah, it, it's if the whole movie would have been that middle portion, I would have loved it as much as Eric. The other parts were a little more the going in and the going out of what she's in weren't quite as strong to me, but they weren't they weren't like bad. They just weren't like five star they were like maybe four star. So it's this is the I would definitely recommend this to anyone who likes independent cinema, who likes um, really solid um, creative drama that's not predictable, I guess I would say, who kind of keeps twisting little tropes in ways that you wouldn't expect. I think it's really solid. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't twist tropes in the sense that, uh, hey, look at me, I'm twisting tropes. It, it right. twists them in a way that feels real, like it, you could see actual people you know doing the things yes. that they're doing. It, it takes the things that are tropes because tropes are often based on something that actually happens, but it takes them and instead of doing them in a cliched way, or instead of, like you said, twisting them and making them like super tricky, it just makes them realistic. <laughs> I guess I would say. That's you so know. hard to do. That's so hard to yeah. do. I mean, you, Eric, you mentioned Sound of Metal and now this movie, Sugar Daddy. I haven't seen Promising Young Woman, but I we cover a lot of films. There's something to be said about tropey characters you, when you actually feel like you're in a movie. And even if these characters maybe paper thin or cinematic, you get lost within that world and you, and you just say, hey, it's, it's fine. It's, it's what it is. It's, it's part of the aesthetic. But I guess trying to find real people populating movies, I don't, I don't see much of that. And when they try to do it, sometimes it's very self-conscious. And they, like you were saying, Eric, it gets a little bit too, it, too self-conscious for its own good. It seems that Sugar Daddy 
succeeds at least definitely in the writing and performance level. So, all right. So that is Sugar Daddy. It is now available on VOD from Blue Fox Entertainment. It is directed by Wendy Morgan, written, produced, and stars Kelly McCormack. And I believe probably one of the Sugar Daddies or the Sugar Daddy, the main one maybe is Comfiore, F-E-O-R-E. He will be in another movie we're going to cover next week. It's called Trigger Point stars Barry Pepper. So I'm sure he has another, yes, he has another role in Trigger Point and I'll be doing a rewind of Sugar Daddy next week. So next week will be the Comfiore episode. Tune in to the Comfiore actor spotlight as we cover Trigger Point and a rewind on Sugar Daddy. Now, speaking of actors that we know and love, Barbara Crampton, she is a... You know, I grew up on what, what is it? Reanimator from beyond excellent actress. She is front and center in this movie called Jacob's wife comes out on shutter this week. I got to look it up. I'll, I'll pull it up on my email to see when it, what dates I'm assuming on Friday. And she plays a woman, a pastor's wife. You know, she's, she's stuck in a relationship where she's sort of the yes person to her past, to, to her husband. He's the guy, he's the, He's an alpha in, in the relationship, and that character is pl- played by Larry Fessenden, and a lot of people know him from a lot of genre f- cinema. Both of them are very good actors. And what happens is a simple twist of fate. Yeah, something happens regarding with Barbara Crampton's character. She might have been bitten. Yes, yes, Eric Holmes. Eric Holmes, for listeners, he's pointing to his neck. May, maybe have been bitten by a vampire, but I, I had no oh, and the other neck too, Eric Holmes. But you know what? I had no vamp. I had no idea vampires were, were always surrounded by rats. What's that about? There's a lot of rats in this movie. I think probably there's not there's no none of these James Cagney, you dirty rats. No, there's a there are rats all over this movie. The beginning shot focuses in on the foreground of a rat. Behind the rat is a the chapel or the the church where that pastor works. Okay, so that is Jacob's wife. So what happens is after the, the wife played by Barbara Crampton gets bitten by by a supposed vampire, she has to figure out she becomes an entirely new person. Obviously, that's what happens. And it's the movie deals with how is Jacob's wife going to deal with her new station in life, which is she suddenly loves blood. Will she stay in a relationship with her husband? Or will she just completely move to the other side and become a member of I don't know, Bruce, our vampires are, they're considered undead, right? They're undead. But will she become a member of the undead? I'm assuming. I don't know. Is that, that's part of the whole monster, monster category thing. The, the, yeah, the tree of monsters. She's, she's now an undead. That's a whole premise of Jacob's wife. Eric Holmes, you saw the movie first. What were your overall thoughts regarding Jacob's wife? Well, first of all, I started watching this immediately after Sugar Daddy. So I had to turn it off because I didn't feel it was fair to the movie that I was watching. So I finished it the following day. Um, And then I had time to sit on what bit I saw and then watch the rest of it. And this movie is pretty much a B movie that really, really wants to say something bigger. And I don't think it comes through. Um, It does do some things uh, right. Well, first of all, the rats, that's uh, the, the vampire design is a Nosferatu design the Count Orlock where he's got the two teeth up front and kind of looks like a rat. So that's where right. like, yeah, rats right. come from. Um, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the gore effects are fun um, in a, in a B movie way. I like, I like if they, if this would have stuck as a, just a B movie, I, I probably would have liked it a lot more. It's the, uh, um, the other stuff that's trying, I commend them for trying it. I just don't think it quite pulls it off. Uh, I guess some some of the stuff it does pull off is it it uh, really uh, leans into the sexuality of the main character, who's a lot older than uh, someone is usually sexualized. So yeah. I guess very good. You know, and yeah. her and her her and her husband are older older people, and you know they they still have a, a you know. I don't know that they had a healthy sex life, but once she started turning into a vampire, they certainly did. And yeah. that's not something you usually see on screen uh, very often. You know, usually you think that uh, when you hit a certain age, your uh, your uh, ghibli bits just kind of fall off. <laughs> and apparently yeah, that's not, you know. Your ghibli bits suddenly fall off and all you do is podcast and invest. Dick in- and puss, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I, I did like that they uh, lean into the 
uh, sexuality of uh, older people. And I do like the story of her, um, you know, she's kind of reserved and uh, her turning into a vampire as a metaphor of her kind of breaking out and becoming her own woman. Hence the title, Jacob's Wife. Are you going to be yourself or are you just Jacob's wife? I, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious in the movie. I just think that uh, that part of the movie could have been done a lot better. And there's a really good movie there. This just didn't quite pull it off. But as a uh, just a fun vampire movie, um, this kind of works on a B movie level, I think. So this is a slight recommend for you. Eric? Yeah, kind of. Uh, especially like the last half. Like if you're, you know, if you're the kind of person that watches, uh, you know, Evil Dead or I don't know, uh, Dawn of the Dead, you know, the uh, Reanimator. You know, if you watch those kind of movies, you probably dig the last half a lot more than you would the first half. But also, um, I don't know. There, there's, there's hints of stuff in the first half and throughout the main theme. There's hints that of like. Uh, really good ideas they just don't they just don't drive them home well you know okay my, my take is i am right on that train with you eric there's but we see it a couple of different ways yeah it could have succeeded as a b movie and but there's two trains running in this film okay right you were talking about the b movie and i felt the b movie stuff the vampire stuff even though the gore stuff was good they didn't build that you mentioned nosferatu they didn't build that vampire world the vampires the main vampires called the master they didn't build that world in my opinion enough okay so what you're left with is jacob's wife ultimately is a relationship film between barbara crampton and larry fessenden barbara crampton plays the character ann fetter and larry fessenden is pastor jacob fetter as a showcase for barbara crampton i think she's wonderful in this movie and you're talking about her her character being yeah excellent her character being sexualized the work that Fessenden and Crampton do in this movie within this within the script is excellent. And I just wish, oh, look, I would recommend, I would definitely recommend this movie if you have appreciated Larry Fessenden's previous work and especially Barbara Crampton's work as an actress over the years. She, this is a must see if you're a Barbara Crampton fan. And on a, on a lower level, it works as a relationship film, but there are definite flaws within Jacob's wife, not enough world building on the monster part. We, we just talked about it at the beginning of the movie, PG psycho Gorman, which where it's a perfect balance of the monster universe of the sci-fi universe, the th domestic drama universe. It's just lived in. It's campy. It's messy. It is gory. It is everything you want. And it's, yeah. Did I say funny? It's so many amazing ingredients. This movie, like Eric Holmes was saying, it tries to be a lot of things. It just, Sometimes you, sometimes you want to eat the entire gumbo. Sometimes you just want to pick stuff out and just put it to the side and put it on a napkin. There are a lot of, there are several elements to this movie that I didn't think really gelled. Ultimately, the world building in Jacob's wife to me was subpar, but as an acting showcase for Barbara Crampton, Barbara Crampton and Larry Fessenden, I think it's really worth watching. So I had a good time watching this movie. I saw the flaws and Eric, you give it a slight recommend. I give it a I give, a, I give it a recommend for, for those main actors. I just wish the director, who is directed by director Travis Stevens, just wish that a little, there was a little bit more focus, maybe a couple more read-throughs on the script. There are some flaws in this movie that should have been worked out. The kink should have been worked out. The third act, third act, we're talking about the third act of Gunda. We mentioned briefly mentioned it. There, it it's an emotional ending, very subtle. Sometimes you got to really, in my opinion, Having a knockout ending really sometimes is, um, you know, sometimes it, it, it can really save a movie. And to me, this ending in the movie, even though the final shot was amusing, the final act to me could have been just a, a little bit more well thought out as, a, as opposed to obligatory. Now, with all those complaints, again, Crampton, Fessenden, fabulous in Jacob's Wife. See it just to see them go to town, especially Crampton. She's, she's good doing those jazzercise in 1980s, whatever calisthenics workouts. And it's really funny. And then she, you know, she's 62. Yeah, exactly. Eric, you know, you don't see, you don't see actresses who are in their early sixties do really out there, you know, not out there really explicit sexual stuff and kudos to that for having that in Jacob's wife. So, and this movie really tries, I, I'm not even wa waffling. It has its flaws, but I ultimately I would recommend this movie. But just remember, there are flaws within Jacob's Wife. 
notwithstanding the excellent performances by Crampton and Fessenden. So I was wrong. It is not streaming on Shutter. It is available in theaters, on demand, and digital starting April 16th. Okay, it's running 98 minutes. Ultimately, down the road, it'll it is part. It is presented by RLJE Films and Shutter, and that is Jacob's wife. Okay, and hopefully down the road, maybe who knows? Maybe Bruce Perky will check this out down the road. But he is covering a lot of films as well, so we'll see what he does with that. I always promise to see movies, but eventually, the all these things, I still haven't seen a lot, a whole lot of movies that I promised to see. The Find Your Film in the Find Your Film universe. I'm thinking of Eyes Without a Face. That's one movie I still have to get to. So that is our main reviews for this week. We're going to start off with Bruce Perky. Do you have, oh, do you, uh, wait, wait. If we start off with you, Bruce, your recommendations, will, will they be in the box universe or will they not be? Wait, hold on. One is and one isn't. The last one will be in the box universe. I have a recommendation that's not in the box universe. Okay, let's do it. Let's hear it. This is, uh, the movie is called, well, I think it's originally was titled Full Circle, but got released as The Haunting of Julia. Mm. 1978 it's on shutter it's on amc plus i believe uh you can find it for rental everywhere directed directed by richard lon crane or lone crane julia is played by mia farrow this is one of those movies that uh, i remember seeing it on tv way back when and i remember liking it but i hadn't seen it much since then and i think it took forever to get kind of released in a more wide way her husband is magnus played by care delay delay i don't know how to say it the guy from 2001 Yep. Open the pod, David Doris. And then um, Mark, a very young Tom Conti in this movie. Very, yes. very young. From Ruben um, Ruben. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> from a few things, but yes, from Ruben Ruben. Yes. Yeah. This is one of those 70s haunted, um, slow burn, if you like, burnt offerings or the Sentinel or especially Don't Look Now. This mm. is strong, mm -hmm. strong, strong relations to Don't Look Now. And I'll give you the basic, the basic plot and you'll see why. It, it starts out and there is a tra tragedy, like Don't Look Now. There's a tragedy and um, very quickly we cut to Julia, who has basically run from her husband, doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. She can't deal with him since the tragedy. She um, is pretty mentally shattered. She gets a brand new home. She's living in England. She gets a brand new home and quickly she starts thinking that she's being haunted by the ghost of a child and she's not sure who that child is exactly. It has very eerie and creepy and interesting path that it goes down. Uh, it has some things that are very traditional for that year period, but it has some things that are not. Like I said, especially if you like Don't Look Now, it has a very similarly moody, strange, claustrophobic vibe to it. A uh, really cool score by Colin Towns. If you can look that up and you can hear the score on like YouTube and stuff, you can kind of get a feel for it. Kind of electronic, kind of piano, very moody. Uh, and probably one of my favorite final shots, like there's a about a two to three minute shot directly before the end credits that is fantastic. It's like the last thing you see in this movie. Does it reach the level of Don't Look Now? Almost the level? Almost. I mean, I, I don't think that's to me is like a straight up classic. And I think a lot of people will discount this if they see it as kind of it's some kind of a copycat because there's some very strong thematic comparisons. But I think it's kind of its own thing. It, it's a little more of a straight ahead ghost story. But like Don't Look Now, there are questions on whether it's really a ghost or is it really some mental issues that is going on with this person? And is there something else disturbing going on? But it has enough differences and I think enough of its own unique flavor that I think it's kind of a little lost gem from that era that you don't hear about hardly at all. And it's I think you'd really like it, Greg, for oh, sure. I'd really, okay. I, it surprised you, the movie, upon the- Yeah, upon it surprised me when I first saw it. Yeah, it, it surprised me when I first saw it a lot because I'd never even heard of it. And I, and I was reading some stuff about it and I guess it was kind of lost for a while. Like it got, never got released. It like, it got made and just kind of buried. And then it kind of got found and re-released. So I think it originally got made in like 76 and didn't get come out for real until like 78. And watching it again, I, I still think it holds up. I think it's really good for, for people who like that style. So Okay, so that is The Haunting of Julia. It's currently streaming on Shudder. Here's my personal recommendation. Listeners, get into your room. Watch Don't Look Now. Let me see what I'll start with. Don't Look Now. I think there was going to be... And then watch... No, wait. Watch First, watch The Innocents. 
then watch Don't Look Now, and then watch this movie. Watch The Haunting of Julia, a.k.a. Full Circle. What's going to happen to that person, Bruce, at the end of it? They might be really unsettled. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be really, really unsettled. Yeah. And for good measure, throw in some repulsion too. See oh, how, God, yes, yeah. See how, your, see how your day goes by the end of that day. But I can't wait to see The Haunting of Julia. It, you know, if I if I decided, you know, let's just say I'm, I'm on my iPad. I know this is a horrible comparison, Bruce. I was thinking of your previous review of The Brood. I know two different movies, The Haunting of Julia or The Brood. Which one? Which one? Roll the dice. What, what's what's it? What is it? The brood is a little more bonkers. I think the brood is a little more out there. So yeah. I think you would, I think you would get more surprises from the brood. But if you are in the mood for something more like Don't Look Now and that innocence, that kind of vibe, then I think you'll be better off with uh, Haunting of Julia. Okay, so that that is uh, your review of the Haunting of Julia. That is a big recommendation from Bruce Perky, streaming on Shutter. Eric Holmes, you got a couple of recommendations. What you I got? Do. What you well, got, buddy? I, I guess I'll start off with the uh, Criterion release. I uh, went to Entertainment Mart and picked oh. up Revanche. I Revanche. believe it's uh, it's very sophisticated. Maybe French or German for revenge. I think. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Uh, directed by Gold Spiegelman, and uh, it came out in two thousand eight. This movie is freaking fantastic. Um, this Wait is, a second. Uh, is that a bl- was that a blind buy? Did you just see Revanche and you just said, "Hey, that's yeah. a cool name." Hey, no, that's I mean, Criterion. Yeah. I mean, look, look, look at the, look at the uh, cover. I mean, amazing. Got a, got a dark forest, a little uh, river with the little ripples in there. I'm like, and it's called the Revanche. And uh, I don't know, just said, yeah, it looked like something I might uh, be into, or yeah. maybe I won't. We'll find out. Turned out, I was very into it. This is a movie I could give you the full plot and it wouldn't spoil anything because this movie gives you perfect information very early on. And so a lot of the movie is seeing how, like the audience knows everything, the characters don't. So a lot of the fun in this movie is seeing how close the characters get to finding out this thing or when they do find out, so on and so forth. But I won't give you perfect information. I'll let you watch that and find it out for yourself, which you can find on a Criterion Disc. Uh, I believe it's also on HBO Max or HBO okay. Plus. Which, which one is it? HBO Max, I think. Yeah, HBO Max, yeah. Yeah, wh- whichever one the HBO one is, uh, it's on there. But there's a, uh, the main actress's name is Teresa. And she is, uh, she works at a brothel. And she works at the brothel with her boyfriend. And I don't remember at all what the boyfriend's name was. Tamara. He's kind of, he's, Tamara? Tamara. 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 They, Tamara. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, she works her with her boyfriend who works as a bouncer, but no one there knows that they're together. Cause I guess that'd be bad news if they found out they were together. And uh, you know, they keep uh, they, they were having a discussion about her debt. She's like a $30,000 in debt. And if he can come up with like $80,000, uh, he could uh, buy into like a restaurant with a partner of his or something. Mm-hmm. And so they're trying to, you know, it, it, at first it's kind of like pie in the sky like oh one day we'll you know we'll save enough money and we'll be able to you know do all this stuff and then Tamara's boss gets a little uh, Harvey Weinstein on her and so uh and the uh boyfriend was hiding under the bed when this happened and so he wasn't he wasn't having any of that and she's uh got kind of roughed up by one of the clients and and he's like you know what we're we're out so he goes to her hotel, sneaks out all her bags because uh, I think they're not real clear about it, but I think there's like a, a captive sort of thing about this brothel. I don't like, they seem to be there on their own. Like, it seems like they can leave whenever they want to. But I think the idea is that, oh yeah, you can leave whenever you want to. Go ahead. Mm. Anytime you want to leave. <laughs> right, know? right. And so they, they end up uh, leaving and uh, they sneak out one night and the boyfriend decides he's going to rob a bank. And so they rob the bank and then a bunch of stuff happens as does in movies when there's a bank robbery and the rest of it I'll leave because that's like, you're about half hour, 40 minutes into it once the bank robbers robbery's done. And then you have the rest of the movie, which is not at all a heist movie. And it's basically you're watching things kind of how they play out. And it's 
not quite the movie you would think of in a movie like this. Wow. I, kind of, I, I cool. really, I really, really want to say more. Um, the, there's uh, certain things that happened in this that are just kind of jaw dropping and not in like a twisty way. Like I said, you have all the information about how shortly after the bank robbery, you get all the information you need. It's just the characters don't have the information. So you get to see, you know, someone shows up and you're like, oh, shit, you uh, shouldn't be there. Or someone holds out a thing. And it's like, oh, I should have left that on the table. So-and-so is going to see it. Or someone does see the thing. And you're like, oh, shit, how are they going to react once they see the thing? You know, wow. so so that there's a bunch of that in the ending of this. I want to say it ends like I, because this whole movie is not a cat and mouse game at all, but it kind of ends like one. And uh, the ending is, the ending is very satisfying and Whoa. very fantastic. And I really like, I could tell you what the ending is and it wouldn't make any sense because you don't know the stuff other stuff <laughs> didn't tell you, but uh, just suffice it to say the ending of this is fantastic. And uh, pretty much all the performances are great. Um, just yeah it, uh i was i was pretty well blown away by this movie it was just one of those movies uh, you know bruce was talking about the haunting of julia being you know he wanted to see it again, and again and he said it's a gem do you think, think this movie a gem like as far as like and just really found 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 treasure oh, yeah. for you yeah, yeah okay yeah for, yeah for sure the, the, this is one of those it came out in 2008 and uh i mean i've seen the dvd around but i just i never heard anyone talk about this and i'm sure now that i know of it i'll probably go on youtube and just see like thousands of reviews of, like where the fuck was i but yeah. I mean, i'm i'm here now and i'm here for it and this movie's great and uh i'm kind of uh i'm kind of sad it took me this long but i'm finally i'm glad i finally came around to it for sure oh i totally want to see i'm totally watching that and the haunting of julia so that is Re revanche it's available Aircom's got it as a DVD, DVD as a DVD Criterion Collection yeah. DVD from Entertain Mart, his local, I guess, place to get physical media, and it's also available on HBO Max. So, and I'm sure streaming and whatnot, and we'll have all those details in the uh, the notes and all that stuff. So, that is you have one more recommendation before we get to the box, Eric? Yeah, yeah. Let me pull that one up. Uh, the uh, uh, see who the director is, but. Uh... The other one, I, I saw this last week, but we didn't get to it. And uh, maybe we did, and I just got donkey brains and forgot, no. which <laughs> we all know happens often. Um, <laughs> but this one's streaming on Netflix, and it's uh, called The Last Blockbuster, directed by Taylor Morden, written by Zeke Cam, which is weird to say something's written by someone when it's a documentary. Regardless, they just yeah. uh, interview a bunch of people like Kevin Smith, Brian Posehn, Doug Benson, Paul Schrader, Sam Levine, Jamie Kennedy, so on and so forth. But the star of this is Sandy Harding. She is the manager of the last blockbuster in Bend, Oregon. And it's just basically a bunch of people, you know, a bunch of uh, celebrities you would know, uh, reminiscing about back in the day when they get not just Blockbuster, but just went to video rental stores in general and what it meant to them. Uh, certain ones who worked in uh, video rental stores and what they liked about it, what they didn't. Every once in a while, they'll cut to Lloyd Kaufman, who has absolutely nothing nice to say about Blockbuster, and rightfully so, if you ask me, even though the movie kind of jabs at him a little bit. I think... Uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people look at uh, Blockbuster specifically with rose-colored glasses, and I think Lloyd Kaufman knows all too well. It's like, he forgot about, uh, you know, it did this, did this, pushed all these smaller businesses, you know, tried to sweep them under the rug and strong arm them out of the city. And uh, yeah, I, I get that you want to be nostalgic about it, but I remember, and I'm not... <laughs> And so uh, the, they, they kind of shit on uh, Lloyd Kaufman a little bit in this, which I didn't really appreciate. But, you know, it's uh, it, this is uh, this is a perfect example of a let me like my thing movie. So, you know, what, whatever. Uh, but it is fun. And the uh, uh, the Sandy, the manager of the last blockbuster, because he talked about the one up in Alaska that and the John Oliver thing that happened with that and that one closing down and. And so it's kind of, uh, you know, it, she just, it, for her, it was just a regular nine to five job. And then as Blockbuster started closing, it kind of became a thing. And then even to the point where she kind of became a celebrity in her own right. 
And it's like, I just want to work at a blockbuster. <laughs> like, you know, to, regardless of the corporate uh, bullshit that, you know, blockbuster is known for, they came at it from a point of view of they know their customers. They've had the same customers come in and talk to, you know, like you would a comic book store or a game store, or whatever, you know, the specialty boutique stores that you go into all the time, you develop a relationship with your customers and the customers develop a relationship with the people that work there. And so a lot of it is that. And then of course, you know, it, it talks about blockbusters history and their fuck up with Netflix and all that. So, I mean, this, this, the fact that this movie is on uh, Netflix is a huge flex. <laughs> <laughs> Netflix is like, Hey, remember when we wanted you to buy us and you told us to go kick rocks Hey, check out our new documentary. It's called The Last Blockbuster. And go fuck yourself. <laughs> so, in that regard, pretty hilarious. Um, but I mean, it's a you know the the main characters in this are real sweet people, and the interviews are fun. And even though they pick on Lloyd Kaufman a bit, it's Lloyd Kaufman, dude. Every time he opens his mouth, I want to just fucking hug him. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, this would be a pretty high recommend. And uh, you get a lot of, you know, a lot of nostalgia for sure. But also, don't forget, there was a time where Blockbuster wasn't as, uh, you know, don't don't put all the rose-colored glasses on, I guess. Okay, so that was the last Blockbusters. I, I, the last Black, <laughs> last not the last Black man in San Francisco. It is the last Blockbuster. The reason why I was tongue-tied was I was thinking of all those nostalgic memories of DVDs, and what? No, wait. Am I even saying DVDs? Yeah, DVDs. But mainly, I, I still remember Blockbuster for the VHS stuff, right? The VHS tapes and everything, pretty much. But that's what I think. When I think of Blockbuster, I think of VHS tapes and renting stuff out. So that is that. And have you seen it yet, Bruce? Have you seen them? Have you seen that doc? No, I haven't. It's it's been kind of hovering around there, and other things have just gone above it. But uh, it looks like a like a, one of those when I just want something fun and, and easy to watch it would be a yeah. good one. Yeah, that's exactly what this is. It's not you don't have to run out and watch it now, but uh, if you're like, you know what, I could go for some cotton candy. That's exactly what this is. Okay, so that's that is the last blockbuster. Now we are off to a filmmaker. I've never, you know, I've seen portions of his work, and I've just never really dived into his movies. I'm so excited for Bruce Perky's "What's in the Box" segment. Can you just? <laughs> You know, I've seen open. So the buddy of mine, he actually showed me an opening shot to one of this director's films and was saying how brilliant he is and all that stuff. And I just, for some reason, I don't know, I just never got into it as of yet. <laughs> so excited to see well, what you got to say, yes. Bruce Perky. This is, uh, well, this is from the box and it was suggested by William Lindis, who we love from Movie Bears podcast. Yes. Uh, William Lindis always has interesting and great recommendations uh he recommended i watch the bitter tears of petra von kant by director rainer werner fassbender who i have don't think i've seen anything by and i know he's a very famous and influential art house director especially from the 70s and i think maybe the 80s a little bit i think he directed something like 40 or 45 films and then died young so he he was very prolific in his in his era this is currently available on criterion channel HBO Max, you can rent it and get it a lot of different ways. Wow, how do how to approach this movie? This oh, it's sort of 1970. Oh, I didn't write it down. 70, you have it in front of you? 72? 72, 72, yeah. yeah. So if you do not like art house movies, 70s art house movies, <laughs> movies like we've talked about recently that um could seem like a stage play. German movies. <laughs> this is like the most of almost every one of those categories that you'll encounter. <laughs> so go in forewarned. But if you're adventurous and those kind of things sound interesting to you, then then go forward and, and check out The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. So what is the basic concept? Uh, all women cast, although they do talk about men in their lives, but there is only women in this movie. It takes place pretty much in one room. It pretty much is a five act movie. Each act, something has changed in the setting and time has passed. So you might, you might have one act in and then, you know, six months has gone by and, but you're still in the same room with maybe, well, every, every scene has Petra. And then in some of them, other people have come or gone. Petra von Kant played by Margit uh, Karstensen. Uh, she is obviously the center of the whole thing. It starts out and uh, she's waking up. She's kind of a, you can tell she's like a well-to-do fashion designer. And her assistant, Marlena, 
played by Erm Herman, who was, I guess, the actual lover of Mr. <laughs> Fassbender. So there's a lot of weird subtext there. She is silent in this movie. She walks around almost like a living mannequin and she does, she serves everything that Petra wants. Like in the beginning, Petra's like, go finish that, finish that painting before, before noon, it needs to be done. So off to the side, just silently is this stoic woman who maybe is her lover and maybe is her sub to her dominant over there, like working on this drawing of a, a new fashion that she's going to do. And then in comes Karine, who is this young aspiring model that Petra gets her eyes on. And essentially this is following the, the beginning of, I guess, kind of the emotional downfall of Petra and all the stages she goes through. If you love movies with amazing character arcs, really good acting, a few characters in a room together, this movie is something you will enjoy. And <laughs> wow. I don't know. The, I don't the, know. Uh, You're not selling it for me on this one room, different yeah. scenes, different time, temporal S stuff. Some of the staging is freaking amazing though. Like some okay. of the shots and some of the way that he posts things. Like the perfect example will be <laughs> like, you know, Petra's having a conversation with uh, uh, her friend and then off somewhere in the side, you don't know where her assistant Marlena is standing. And a, the camera will just slowly like go that direction past the mannequins. And you'll just see this Marlena like standing there. Or in one scene, the whole <laughs> scene, the whole scene while stuff is happening in the background, Marlena is passively aggressively just typing and pounding on the typewriter the whole time. Like she's just angry, you know, going on and on and on. This is definitely a love it or hate it kind of movie. If you can get into the vibe, you'll love it. If you can't, you will probably hate it. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I, I, I kind of got into the vibe of it. Um, there's a lot of humor. There's a lot of really great acting. He apparently he wrote this in 12 hours. Oh, wow. And filmed yeah. it in just like 15 days. And when you watch that, it's pretty amazing. The Oh, the cinematography is Michael Ballhaus. If you look up what he's done. Oh, right. Yeah. He has done like most of the Scorsese movies you've ever seen. He has done like a billion famous movies. And this is like a really early work by him. And some of his work in this movie is freaking really beautiful, especially considering a small area, right? He's got this small zone and he just uses it to the max. So just and on that level, it's worth watching just because of the cinematography? Just on a I think if, if the cinematography, and if you're a fan of, I would, and once again, we don't like to talk about movies like plays, but if you're a fan of a really, really good play, that is somehow adapted into like a movie. This does a really good job of that. So if you kind of can get into that play kind of vibe, you will probably get into this movie or those really like, I guess, isolated, very intense character pieces. Like um, I'm trying to think of something where just a few characters like that, that really stands out. What was the movie that was Alan Alda? Like every year he'd meet a person he's having an affair with that one. Um, same time next year, stuff like mm. that. And I've got to say, another cool thing about this, we talked about dogma movies, right? Yep. There is no music in this, except in almost every scene, at some point, Petra has a record player and she'll put on a record. So she'll put on a record and that's the soundtrack for that scene. And the final three minutes of this movie alone is one of the best closing sequences I've ever seen in a movie. Oh my goodness. It is, Hello. It is spectacularly beautiful with music and character based on everything that's happened before. Even if you, even if the movie is like kind of whatever, that final two or three minutes is just like the most perfect ending for this movie it could have ever had. It's, it's wonderful. Okay, so that is The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant or Kant? Kant, yeah. Strong recommendation then, right, Bruce? Strong? Strong recommendation if, if you are into that kind of deal. So if you're into like, you know, play like movies that we talked about a bunch of those lately. And if you're really into art house, like art house stuff you haven't caught, then this would be something for you to dive into for sure. So my, so Michael Ballhaus, Ballhaus is the cinematographer passed away in 2017. Some of the movies he has, he has lens is gangs of New York, the departed Dracula, you know, the, the version directed by Francis Ford Coppola. Goodfellas, The Last Temptation of Christ, After Hours, The Color of Money. I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing a, a sort of trend here. He also lends Primary Colors, directed by Mike Nichols. That's, I think, one of Mike Nichols's 
most underrated films. He, he, he lends sleepers, quiz show, my goodness, the Mambo Kings. What the what look at the Bob. It also lists the music videos. It lists a couple of the music videos that he, he directed. If you look at oh, yeah, true, there. true blue, Madonna, true blue. And <laughs> yeah, my goodness, my goodness, what a career this yeah. guy has had. And probably I'm assuming, you know, Scorsese probably just took him and said, Hey, I, I want to work with you after. And I'm assuming Scorsese was a huge fast better fan. Well, you I know? mean, you think about it. I mean, like, what's a great, a great test for a cinematographer. You've got to make a, a movie that basically takes place in one room, look interesting and vibrant and creative. How do you, I mean, that's a good test, right? Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. That is the bitter tears of Petra von Kahn. I don't know. Eric Holmes, <laughs> do I get to give that one a shot? What do you think? Do you oh, sell? yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I, I mean, no... it, 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 if nothing else, it was William Lindis. So, yeah. Right, yeah. right there. And William Lindis, like... he said it to me, he said, this is a difficult one. You know, he kind of first, you know, put it out that way. You know, if you're really into movies and really into different things, uh, it's worth giving a try to, for sure. So, okay. That and oh, cool. and I didn't even mention like, and this is also considered kind of a groundbreaking movie in lesbian, gay um, cinema, just mm. because of those kind of themes. And it's got in, incredibly strange costumes and wigs, and it's, it's just it's just a weird, it's its own thing for sure. Okay, very right. cool, very cool. So that is what is in the bleeping box, Bruce Perky. What is in the bleeping box? Watch in well. the box, Bruce. Put some lotion <laughs> on the box or else it gets the hose again. <laughs> Very good. Wow, Levine, we've changed. We've changed movies for the box segment. Ted Levine like approves of this message. Wait, wait, was she a real big fat box? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very good. We love Ted Levine. We love but the question is movies. Would, would you fuck this box? Would you would you fuck this box? <laughs> That's wow. Explicit. I'd fuck this box. <laughs> <laughs> Very wow. Look at the look at the look at the uh, blue material. Okay. We're an E. We're an well e. look, um <laughs> just at the end of every episode, we basically have to get Greg like Lord. on his heels there. <laughs> yeah. Um Matt Stillman. Matt Stillman oh, is man. back for oh, another Matt's round Stillman. after yes. the crucifixion of what was that movie? What was that movie? What, what what was Matt's last movie? I forget. He's he always comes in. I I wake up in the morning and on our cinematics face, Facebook group, one of the first things I ever read is Matt Stillman's daily movie recommendations. I I don't know how how many movies he's done this year. He's definitely easily going to get to five hundred by the end of the year. Oh yeah, he's he's doing such a great job. So I am doing a movie called The Kid with a Bike from two thousand eleven, hmm. directed by Jean Pierre Dardenne and Luc Dardenne. Oh, the Darden brothers. That's that should be interesting. So I, I am not very well versed on the the films of the Darden brothers, but I actually interviewed them for a movie of theirs starring I forgot who is that actress, the French actress. I, I mean from from um Inception. Was it Inception? She was um what is that woman's name? I, oh, yes, I know who you mean. Yeah, so I interviewed her and the Darden brothers without actually watching the movie, and that was that was a very unprofessional move on my part, my <laughs> fault, folks. But okay, so that is was it the kid with the bike? <laughs> no, it was it wasn't the kid with the bike. It was some it was something else. I forgot. I got to look it up. Eric Holmes, you got to say something. You have something on the tip of your tongue. Yeah, I uh, just kind of wanted to tease for next week. We got yes. in the earth. We got in the earth, and then I believe Chad Wilfong might be joining us next week. Uh, oh, to talk cool. about people under the stairs sweet and then i also uh want to remind you i will be sending this to bruce real soon rain and then oh. bruce will watch it and then bruce can send it to greg and greg can watch it and then we can yeah. finally break rain out of the box <laughs> definitely that, that is a long-awaited what's in the box segment and we're all going good job by the way eric holmes for, for, for getting that that title we're going to be reviewing it in several weeks once it out it makes the turn the merry-go-round turn of mailing the movie that i was unprofessional at two days in one night it wasn't actually an, an interview with him i was at a press conference small small little room just like the like just like the petra von kant room we were in a small room and i interviewed marion cotillard and the Dardenne ah, brothers yes. And I had the gall to ask questions at the press conference without watching. I, and I still haven't watched two days, one night. So listeners, if you ever think, and you're a publicist, and you ever think of asking me to watch a movie and interview your wonderful and talented actors and filmmakers, please, first off, go with the professional, go with the professional bent and hire, or not, not hire, 
commission Bruce Perky or Eric Holmes to do your interviews because like most likely I'm in a room looking up cryptocurrencies and stuff. So these are the more professional parts of find your film, Eric Holmes. Yes, sir. To to your credit though, two days and one night. I mean, that's a pretty big commitment. That's a, that's a lot of movie to watch (laughs) at one time. I probably parse it out into like a month time, you know? Very very cool. Very cool. Is that like the Snyder cut of something? Two days, one night? I still haven't seen the Snyder cut. You you know, you're right. You know, for, you know what? They got a, they, they got army of, the dead coming out but i can't wait for another five years when they come out with the real version of army of the dead <laughs> oh yes yes that is a i didn't that, that not so veiled there eric holmes not so <laughs> veiled with that <laughs> well we had a, this was a good episode we have so many movie recommendations so i don't know how, how else to close this find your film episode there's so many movies i have to see just from your personal recommendations bruce burke you want to final thoughts on, on uh I just want to congratulate you on your new job as the crypto keeper. Uh, It makes me really (laughs) proud of you that you are now. Yes. Yes. And and, and Eric and Bruce and listeners out there, if you ever need any, um, any advice on, on crypto or how to invest your, your money, don't go to me because I'm not a, a, I'm not a financial advisor. That's one of the things you're supposed to say when you're talking about crypto and, and B today, I just saw a, a pretty big dip on my savings. So don't ever come to me for anything. Basically just go with Eric Holmes and Bruce Berkey. That is your best investment in crypto in life and in scheduling interviews with the Darden brothers, Eric Holmes. We're going to close that with you on this find your film episode. Well, I was just going to point out that uh, at least three of the movies we talked about today had really fantastic endings. So maybe this episode doesn't need a great ending because we gave you three movies that did have wonderful endings. Oh, very, very good. Wonderful. That's Eric called Holmes. a cop out. That is called a cop, <laughs> that is called a cop out. Notice one thing. If you ever listen, look at our videos, whenever Eric Holmes, oh, oh, and then, and then PG Psycho Gorman cup again from Bruce Perky. Wonderful. Again. If you have to, if you have to listen, a couple more recommendations before you go. Just remember, PG Psycho Gorman, PG for short, and Flower, uh, Lose the Flower of Evil. Have to check those movies out along with all the other films that Bruce and Eric recommended on this episode of Find Your Film. We'll see you guys next week, and be sure to listen this weekend for Bruce Perky's wonderful interviews with those Oscar artists. All right, guys, take care. <laughs>